the Hall of Famer, former Eagles wide receiver. Another comment from Angelica. My fiance loved having sports on with the draft and last dance this last week weekend. He's going crazy without live sports. I definitely feel his pain, Angelica. It's tough out here right now for us sports fans. And we are now joined by our special guest. Uh, one last comment from Darren. He says, can't trust Wentz. A lot of injury troubles for Wentz. The Eagles selected Jalen Hurts with the second round pick. T.O. is here. That's right. So let's get this thing started. Thank you for joining us on Inquirer Live at lunch. And give me just one second. As I try to bring in our guest for today. Our guest, as we connect, <clears throat> it's connecting right now. Just give us one second. This comment from Frank, I thought Howie and Doug did a great job in the draft. Terrell Owens, he's here. We're just trying to connect with him. Give us just one second, a few technical difficulties. Hopefully this isn't like Teddy Riley and Babyface and we'll get it going pretty soon. Um, TL, just send the request one more time and then we'll bring you into the chat. Just send the request and it should connect. All right, got the request. Give me one second. Waiting for Terrell Owens here on Inquirer Live at lunch. We're connecting now, and Terrell in the building. Terrell, yeah, what's up? Terrell, Terrell what's here, how bro? You? No doubt, what's happening? Not too much. Thanks so much for jo joining us here today. Absolutely. How are you holding up so far in the pandemic? Oh, man, I'm good, bro. Uh, you know, obviously, this is a, a challenging time. I wouldn't say it's a tough time, but I think it's a challenging time for, for everybody. So, um, you know. People like myself, uh, you got a lot of entertainers, um, you know, people in the industry that are really out here encouraging and uh, inspiring people to obviously stay safe and just to let everybody know we're all in this together. You know, no matter uh, what your color is, what, what background you came from, what your job description was before or after this, um, this is affecting everybody. So, uh, man, I'm, I'm doing good, man. Just uh, I'm here down here in Florida. I'm um, just trying to enjoy some of this uh, this good weather, trying to stay in a little bit of shape that I can. Um, you know, I'm sure you saw the driveway challenge that I did uh, a while back. So, uh, so right, yeah, right. just trying to do whatever I can, man, and just encourage people, you know, just to have faith over fear. Um, again, obviously, you know, we have a president that's, you know, trying to trying to lead this, com this country best way he can. But, uh, again, just do all the research that you can um, on your own just to try to do whatever you can. Wash your hands be safe and practice social distancing if you can. And also, also wear your mom's mask. Now, I wanna thank her so much for making this interview possible today. Uh, just the sweetest lady and talking to her on Instagram. Um, I wanna start off the conversation with how she's helping during the pandemic with, by making customized masks. 
Oh yeah, my mom, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that I have a love and affection for fashion and, and also home decor. But, you know, just to touch on the whole mask thing, she was a, she's been a seamstress uh, for as long as I can remember. Uh, mm -hmm. She made a lot of our, uh, our clothes. When you talk about my, my brother and sisters, um, when we couldn't, she couldn't afford clothes uh, when I was younger. Um, that's what she did. She made our clothes, you know, even from when I was, uh, like I said, a toddler. Although, I mean, she still makes me clothes now. I mean, even to this day, she'll, she'll whip up some, whether it's some shorts, you know, some shirts or whatever the case may be. So now she's doing the same thing with my nieces, my nephews. Um, so again, that's just a skill that she, she's acquired and um, she's pretty good at what she does. So talent, like I said, uh, it rubbed off on me. Um, so I think that's where I have my love and affection for, uh, for, for fashion, where it came from. But yeah, she's doing her part um, really just to, again, earn a little extra income on the same, at the same time, but, you know, really just helping the masses because obviously there's been a shortage uh, of masks. Um, again, something is better than nothing. Um, you have a lot of people that's trying to criticize that, oh, it doesn't have a filter or whatever the case may be. You're trying to say 100% of the masks that are being made by other people just, you know, being entrepreneurs and uh, just like my mom uh, have filters, but as I responded to that that individual, something is better than nothing, and so she's very creative. I've had I've stood in line twice uh, for over an hour uh, mm -hmm. outside a Joanne fabric fabric store um, <laughs> just to just to you know buy some fabric for for her, send to her yeah. so she can so she can uh, bless everybody with her skills and and some math. So uh, yeah, so if That's you awesome. follow her on on Instagram, it's uh, M O. B Y and her her name is Marilyn. Um, so yeah, just go to uh, her uh, her uh, Instagram. Um, we got a number and a, an assorted amount of fabric. Um, she can make it, you know, pretty pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, one for fifteen, two for twenty five. Um, as as I said, she she she's doing what she can to to help uh, a lot of people that can't go out and and, and get masks right now because obviously there's a worldwide shortage of the actual. <laughs> Uh, Matt in with an N45, in something 45 or whatever mask. So mm -hmm. um, she's yeah. doing a part and I'm doing whatever I can to kind of spread the word uh, for people that can't get masks. Now you know where you can go get them. Absolutely. Go check out her Instagram. A lot of cool masks. I saw the Alabama Roll Tide mask that she Yeah, created. yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're Alabama fans. And again, the rivalry, uh, Auburn is right up the road. So again, you know, we're trying to include, you know, everybody, especially in, in, uh, in Alabama. So uh, trying to you know be creative um, with the with the fabrics and and for me it's 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 fun for me because I get to go to the fabric store and then provide her with you know different fabrications um, and prints and, and and what have you that she's not uh, not she's not that does that's not available to her so um, I'm getting creative with you know just kids adults you know I'm mm -hmm. looking for frozen mat uh, frozen fabric all types of uh, Thomas the Train types of fabric. <laughs> I mean, all types of stuff. Pineapple prints, everything. So I'm just yeah. sending an assortment amount, assorted amount of uh, different different fabrications to her, and she's doing what she does best. That's awesome. That's awesome. So standing in uh, the lines of fabric stores is one thing that you're doing during this pandemic. Yeah. I saw last night as I was scrolling on Instagram that you were watching The Last Dance as well. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And you posted that photo of Jordan. I'm curious yeah. what impact he had on your career. Um, again, I, I think, you know, growing up in that era, especially, you know, watching Michael Jordan, again, I didn't see the beginning of his career. Uh, obviously came in, I think, 84, 85. I, didn't, I had no clue. I wasn't watching, you know, basketball at that time. I was raised by my grandmother and my mom. So, you know, TV, you know, was limited uh, as far as what we watched. Um, so I, I didn't really get a glimpse of Michael Jordan until like, I think, late, uh, well, early 90s. Uh, early 90s, uh, mm -hmm. um, going into my senior year, junior senior year, because I graduated high school in 92. So uh, I got a, I got a, got a glimpse of, of Michael Jordan and, and, and the Bulls. And, you know, I gravitated to the Bulls and got to watch him play. And then, you know, over the course of my career, um, again, as a teenager, being in high school, I, I was just like any other kid across the country. Uh, I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Uh, football was a, probably the farthest thing, farthest thing on my mind. Um, you talk about, you know, as far as me playing a professional sport, that was the last thing that I thought I would end up uh, doing because I had such a love and affection and a passion to play basketball. And so I did that in high school and I played I played basketball uh, in college as well at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So when you think about what Michael Jordan, um, what he embodies, um, I think 
the documentary, I think, is it's a, a very timely piece because everybody that has witnessed Kobe, everybody that has wit witnessed LeBron James, especially, and I mentioned those two because you think of some of the top top two or three players, those guys are in conversation as the greatest to ever play the game. And so it has shed light and will enlighten a lot of these young guys that never got to see Michael Jordan. Um, and right. they, got, they get to see now uh, why there's such a debate, why there's such barbershop talk and discussion as to who's the greatest of all time. Is it LeBron or, or, or is it Michael Jordan? Um, for me, my, my, my top three are Michael Jordan, Kobe, and then you can factor LeBron in there at number three. Uh, LeBron is, 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 is probably the most remarkable, um, gifted athlete, I think, that has ever graced the basketball court in the, national, in, in the, in the NBA. And so um, not to take anything away from his accomplishments uh, or anything of that nature, but when you think about Michael Jordan, who has gone to six finals and won six finals, and you look at the record um, and the great accomplishments of going with LeBron going to nine finals, but he's lost as many as Michael has won. And so that's where I differentiate the two. And then, and like I said, him to be number three is because you look at Kobe. Kobe went to a number of finals and he's won five championships. So you have six with Michael Jordan, five with Kobe, and you have only three with LeBron James. So it all comes down to championships for you. Well, I mean, that factors into it. That right. factors into it. But when you think about now, like I said, to shed mm -hmm. life, if you don't want to put, if you don't want to narrow it down to championships, I think this is where the documentary enlightens mm -hmm. and shares with everybody to show why people say that Michael Jordan is better than LeBron is because right. now you get to see the work ethic. You get to see what a lot of people say that LeBron doesn't have. And, 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 in that killer instinct of having that it factor, you know, having it every night on the court. You get to right. see that passion in which Michael Jordan, I think it was instilled in him as a kid, you know, coming from high school, uh, from, from college, and his dad and his brothers, they explained to him what motivated him, what drove him to be um, as such a passionate and driven uh, basketball player and who we know as now is the greatest basketball player uh, to ever live we get to see and take an inside peek at what made him Michael Jordan, why they call him Airness, why they call him the black cat, you know, why and in his rookie year, you have a guy, Hall of Famer and Larry Bird, that describes him as God, you know, disguised as Michael Jordan. You don't get, you, you don't have uh, such a comment, you know, coming from such a great, um, like, like Larry Bird and others, if, you, if it's not warranted. Right, right, right. Well, how about that Rodman backstory? I couldn't believe that. The Vegas trip and, and the team allowing him to take a 48-hour trip and Jordan having to go to his room and, and I guess he said he was in his bed or somewhere else. Who knows where Rodman was? I just couldn't believe it. Um, your thoughts and your reaction when you were watching that episode? Well, I, 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 saw, I, I saw a tweet by my guy Donovan uh, uh, Donovan Mitchell, when he said, man, you know, everybody is now, you know, they're talking about the load management with, you know, with, mm. with LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard. They're like, man, little did we know, Rodman, you know, he invented load management. <laughs> um, and, but, the, but what's so unique about this is that you have, it, it really gives you some insight on the type of coach that Phil Jackson was. Mm. To, to, to really understand the personalities of each individual that he's coaching. Granted, it's about 15 guys, whereas a lot of coaches in the, in the football world, there's a lot of personalities um, that you have to manage. But this should give you an insight uh, of, of how intuitive, uh, how insightful Phil Jackson was to, to maximize the potential of each and every player. I'm sure he had that, you know, with all of his players, understanding what Michael could do, what, what, what Scotty, what Paxson, what Kerr, um, you know, Cartwright, Horace Grant. He knew how to get the best of his players. And with every team, you're going to have a guy with such a, a enigmatic personality. There's, there's, there's a ton of these personalities like a Dennis Rodman uh, on teams. I'm sure everybody probably – probably felt like I was one of those guys when I played. There was always something different about every individual that played their prospective sport. And when you, fit, when you see and you watch this documentary, yeah, Dennis is different. There's no, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. He's different. And so in order to get the best out of, out of, out of Dennis, 
um, he had to be treated differently. Um, that's, I mean, you, you, you can talk to a number of coaches and when you coach long enough and you understand players and, 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 and understand that every player has come from different backgrounds and they have to be treated and they have to be coached a little bit different. I think that's where you start to really weed out the good to great coaches. And some of those guys know how to bring the best and, and, and coach those guys. And so I think he did a, a great job managing uh, egos, uh, understanding uh, players, their backgrounds. And so when you look at Dennis Rodman, uh, definitely he was different. And then, I mean, just for – it's it's so weird and odd to think that Dennis had just just the, the balls to go in there and ask for a midseason vacation, you know. Right. Uh, and, and the fact that right. – it was granted to him. He didn't get probably the vacation that he wanted, but to for, for Phil to even bring Michael in in this situation, and obviously I'm sure if, if Michael was the head coach, that wouldn't ever happen because right. Michael was like, what? A vacation? If you send this guy on a vacation, he's not coming he's, back. He's not they coming back him, in 48 but, hours. But wow. for whatever reason, Phil was able to really understand who Dennis was, I guess for that short period of time, gave him and trusted him. I'm sure there was a conversation outside of that. Trusted him like, okay, I'm going to give you this. It may not be the vacation you want. I'm going to give you 48 hours. Do what you need to do. But when you come back, still be ready to play. And then how funny was it that Phil thought this guy was out of shape based on Michael Jordan having to go get him out of his bed, you know, and then he's, he's in, he's in the room oversleeping. He's, he's still partying with Carmen Electra hiding behind right. the couch. You know oh what I mean? But, gosh. but just the fact that they thought this guy wasn't in shape in, in 48 hours, you can't get out of shape in 40, 48 hours. Maybe he, maybe they were running the alcohol out of his system, <laughs> but but you saw what Michael Jordan was doing. He was like, "Yo, he talked to these guys. Like, Look, dude, I'm not finna, run. I'm not right. gonna run and get gas. Like, like, oh, I'm we gotta shape. get this guy in shape." Right. And then you saw that they had to run double just to try to catch up with this guy because you have guys like that. You have guys like Dennis Rodman that, again, they can run for days. Mm -hmm. And I, if you, even if you look at the clips of Dennis Rodman playing, you never saw this guy bent over. You never saw this guy out of shape. This is a guy that was going above and beyond his call of duty. I mean, he understood his role coming off the bench or even starting knowing that, okay, I'm here to defend, get rebounds and get, I don't even think there, when you talk about 50, 50 balls, he wasn't getting 50, 50 balls. He was right. basically getting 80, 20 balls because he yeah. felt like he was going to get those rebounds. And that was, and all that is is effort for all these kids that are watching. There's an example. If you did, if you just watch that documentary, Look at it a little bit more insightful than just watching and hearing people. Look at what Dennis Rodman did. He gave effort. Effort should be effortless, and that, that applies to all sports. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't take, it doesn't take extra work mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. give effort. Right, right. Who was your Phil Jackson of the NFL as, as a coach? Who understood you best as a player, as a person during your career? Andy Reid. Andy Reid. And you still keep in touch with him. From my understanding, you text him after the Super Bowl win this year. What are some of the conversations that you have with him? And then even during your career in Philadelphia, why was he the best coach of your career? I think because he understood me, despite obviously uh, the perception uh, that people had of me uh, at that time. Uh, this is me going from my eighth to my ninth year. And obviously a lot of things that transpired um, when I was in San Francisco for eight years. Uh, you think about uh, them questioning, you know, me questioning things about my quarterback, you know, me having run-ins with uh, the offensive coordinator, um, the, the relationship with uh, Steve Mariucci at that time, our relationship fractured after, after, the, after the, the, the game where I went to the star um, and I felt like he didn't have my back. He didn't support me. Um, I ended up being suspended by him because, because of uh, the media pressure that they felt like I did something, you know, uh, over the top uh, or beyond what they could have ever imagined just by going to the star in the middle of the field. These are things that, that, that made me who I was. I was celebrating. Um, looking back on it, do I feel like it, it could have been looked at as going, you know, going a little bit too far? Um, did I stretch the, the celebration rule? Um, who's to say? There wasn't any rule against it. Um, so at that time, um, I didn't, uh, of all the celebrations that, that, I, that I performed or created or had fun with, um, I was always respectful to the game. Um, I, I did nothing to, uh, to, 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 to embarrass myself. 
All my celebrations were creative. And so for me at that time, I felt like uh, it was a coach that didn't have me, um, didn't understand who I was. And I tweeted about that. Um, when you think about Phil Jackson, who, who, who understood his players, got to know his players. That was something I felt like Steve Mariucci, um, he, he, he was in a position to do, and, and he didn't. Uh, I felt like he was uh, persuaded by the media to, 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 to suspend me. Um, because at that time, the league didn't suspend me. So I felt like in that regard, um, he was in a position where he saw me, him in, in a position of authority. Um, me being just a, an athlete, a, back, a, a black athlete at that, at, at that for that matter, uh, matter of fact. And again, he imposed, uh, you know, his authority on me, I think not in, not in the most um, genuine way. Um, mm. Instead of just having a conversation with me and getting and, and understanding why I did what I did, that that conversation never had uh, mm. happened. He just basically suspended me, basically based on because what I was doing at that time, like I said, even with me emerging as the receiver that I that I was emerging as, um, nobody had seen it. You know, I had started mm. to become a, become a, a receiver uh, into my own, um, mm. and that was obviously under the tutelage of of, of, of Jerry Rice understanding. Um, my positioning, understanding the, the West Coast offense, um, just the opportunity that I possessed and, and was given, the opportunity that I was given. And even my receiver coach, you know, my years there in San Francisco, when you think about Larry Kirksey, who, Kirk, who coached me my first three years, and he coached Jerry Rice prior to that. Uh, he was able to coach the, a couple of great receivers, uh, Hall of Fame receivers now under his belt. Um, I learned a lot from him, um, mm -hmm. you know, being able to communicate one on one, him getting to understand me as a person, not just as a player, but as a person. And mm -hmm. then once he got fired, so crazy, um, mm -hmm. Mariucci ended up firing uh, Larry Kirksey. The only coach that was fired in that, that, that particular year was my receiver coach. And he fired him because he felt like he couldn't control me. He brought everybody back except for my receiver coach. So then on the staff at that time, George Stewart was, uh, was the special team coach. So he was put in uh, to replace Larry Kirksey. Mm -hmm. I have the utmost respect for George Stewart, who's now, I think he's a special teams coach um, with the Los Angeles uh, Chargers. Um, mm -hmm. George Stewart was very instrumental in developing me, encouraging me, pushing mm -hmm. me to be – the best Terrell Owens, which is probably the best version the, uh, uh, of, of, my, of, of Jerry Rice um, that they had seen. And so I knew that I couldn't be the next Jerry Rice. I took what I could um, from, from learning from him, watching him practice, watching him play games, watching film uh, on him um, on my own time, um, and then just bringing my physical attributes and my capabilities to the game. And so you, you factor in all of that, all of that um, mm -hmm. in a ball of wax, and, you, and, and here I am. You, you, you get T.O. Um, right. So I realized that were, Jerry was a very special individual. Mm -hmm. um, he had two quarterbacks that were able to enhance his ability. When you think about Joe Montana, when you think about Steve Young, mm -hmm. there was no drop-off of talent at that quarterback position. So you know why he, he holds the records that he holds, yeah. um, you know, yeah. they, cause they, because they complimented him. They complimented mm -hmm. him. So mm -hmm. you think about, you know, talking about coaches um, that get the best out of players, Andy Reid saw from afar mm -hmm. what I did against him when I played against him. So you think now I go into free agency and he has an opportunity um, to, to, to get me in addition to what they already had, they had gone to, what, four NFC championships mm -hmm. um, and never got to the Super Bowl prior to me getting there. And then an opportunity to enhance, uh, to complement uh, that offense, to complement Donald Mc Mc McNabb, um, that shows you what a cerebral mind that he is. So mm -hmm. in a sense, you know, he had that sort of like Phil Jackson, um, right. you know, mentality right, um, right. In, in the football world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I relished that the opportunity because that's all I ever wanted was to have a drop back quarterback um, that could throw every every route um, that could throw the ball down the field. I didn't have that um, when I was uh, early on in my career with uh, the 49ers. I only got a, I only I hadn't reached my potential or peaked when um, when Steve Young left the game. I only played mm -hmm. three years with him. So mm -hmm. when you think about the drop back quarterbacks and what I could have done. Um, the entirety of my career, there's no telling what I, what I could have done. But just the fact that um, 
Andy Reid realize uh, that the, the, the skill set that I have um, to, to know and see um, how I would be able to complement that offense uh, was remarkable. And that's all I ever wanted. You know, even when I was in San Francisco, I wanted to be able to be utilized to the best of my ability. When I, when I finished a game, when I played a game, I wanted to be, I wanted to be exhausted. I wanted to be exhausted when I, when, I, when I left the football field and go home. I wanted to be exhausted. There are times, I mean, several times, several years, where I played games and I felt like I did nothing. I did nothing. I, le I felt like I left a lot of plays out on the football field. When I went to Philly, I trust me, Andy Reid maximized. He mm -hmm. maximized the potential uh, that I possessed. And so that's why he'll always, and I've said it time and time again when they've asked me, and I, and I was coached by a number of coaches. Uh, unfortunately, I only got to play one year with George Seifert, uh, who, who coached, you know, Jerry Rice, Steve Young, John Taylor, all these guys. And I did my uh, – I, I just got inducted into the San Francisco uh, Hall of Fame uh, last yeah. November. Um, mm -hmm. George Seifert spoke, and he basically said he, he had no idea. After mm -hmm. coaching me for one year, my rookie year, he was honest. He said, I didn't see. I didn't see mm -hmm. – the T.O. that I became, he didn't see that as, as, as a rookie. And so that just shows you that, you know, if you, for, these, for these kids that are watching and people are watching, if you have desire, dedication, and discipline, the mm -hmm. sky's the limit. Uh, the sky's the limit as to what you can accomplish. And so you guys have that in a number of your draft picks this year. Um, but, yeah, when you talk about some of the greatest coaches, uh, it's really only one for me um, that, that, that's my favorite. That's Andy Reid. You talk about the draft a little bit, um, and you talk about the upgrades that the Eagles made at the wide receiver position. It was a talented draft class for wide receivers this year. Who's the T.O. of this year's class? I don't know. If the, I, I, I mean, if you think about the receivers, um, I, I, don't, I don't see any T.O.s. You know, when you talk about, you know, um, any, having, any? having that run after catch ability, uh, physicality when you, when you once they get the ball in their hands, uh, what you see in a number of these guys. Um, you talk about uh, C.D. Lamb. You talk about Higgins. You talk about Jerry Judy. Um, these guys are are of all those guys that I mentioned. Um, Jerry Judy would probably be the more polished route runner. Um, what I see from him as a guy that have played in a pro style, similar uh, type of offense down in, in the University of Alabama. So I feel like those guys that played in that type of system will be better prepared going going in and making uh, their name into the pros. Um, they're going to be they're going to be well equipped um, to handle any situation. Um, but I don't really see any guys right now um, of this of this receiving core um, that 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 reminds me of myself. You know, mm -hmm. could there be a guy uh, to emerge? Of course. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they can't be, but right. we're talking about guys my size to, to, to really kind of emulate what I what I brought to the game. Um, that's I don't think these, I, I don't know what receiver that's 225 pounds or whatever. I don't even think, you know, they cracked 220 um, mm -hmm. uh, of the ones that got drafted. Um, all these guys are what about maybe six one. Um, these are more speedy guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about uh, uh, Henry Rogues that that right. got drafted before Judy. The first one off the board. Was, yeah, that that was a that was a surprise pick. You know, uh, you know, when you think about receivers that you know the the the, the Los Angeles Vegas Raiders or whatever uh, mm -hmm. they acquired. So um, these are these are uh, receivers that are more small in stature but they play big. And so now all they have to do is just enhance their abilities, learn, um, understand how to read coverages, uh, mm -hmm. understand too that, you know, this is a little bit different than, than college. Um, you have to catch the ball, get upfield. There's not a whole lot of dancing around. You're not going to be able to juke, you know, guys make two or three, four moves and then, you know, make something happen. Um, everybody's fast. You got to understand that defenses will be, they'll be converging uh, on you as, as a, as, as a unit. So, it's all about, you know, how, how quickly they can understand uh, the game and uh, really eliminate a lot of mistakes and just to be, be productive for, for the prospective teams. How are you feeling this morning if you're Carson Wentz and the Eagles make around the selection of uh, Jalen Hurts in the, this past weekend? How are you feeling if you're Carson Wentz this morning? Uh, I mean, you, you, you have to be, re be realistic and understanding, like, okay, um, Obviously, you know, they're, they're, they're the management, uh, the organization, um, 
they're 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 making moves uh, to protect you know their organization and have somebody come in that uh, I think number one uh, he's a proven winner in Jalen Hurts. Um, he's played in a pro style offense, so he's able he will be able to adjust uh, to whatever situation. Um, that you put him in, being that he played at University of Alabama, then he goes over to uh, University of Oklahoma and, and still be productive. Um, again, just the, the mentality. Um, nothing seems to rattle this guy. This guy is even killed no matter the situation. And I like Jalen Hurt because he's, he, he's a God-fearing man. Um, this is a guy that walks in his faith, and he doesn't allow or enable uh, the outside noise uh, to, to manifest and rattle him. So if I'm again, if I'm if I'm if I'm Carson Wentz, um, this should be able uh, to motivate him in a positive way um, mm -hmm. to make sure number one, he's healthy, and take advantage of all the opportunities in order for uh, I guess the city of Philadelphia for him to live up to the expectations and the potential in which they drafted him some years back. So again, this shouldn't be a surprise considering um, that. The last two to three years, he's been, you know, injury uh, riddled. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, uh, now obviously it's his job to lose. Uh, but when you think about, you know, having to look over your shoulder, um, he has to know that Jalen Hurts is no slouch. He's right. going to be able to thrive in any situation. And if you give this guy a crack, he's going to take. He, he's going to slip. He's going to slip through that crack, and he's going to make the most of it. So again, this has to be when. Now I wouldn't say heavily on his mind. But it should put him in a mind mindset and a mind frame. Okay, you know this is the or this is this is the, this is the stance that the organization has taken. Um, they he has to understand and be a professional that um, this is just it's a business. And so he, when you look at like I said, the last two to three years, uh, he hasn't completed any any of those seasons. So now I think number one, like I said earlier, he has to number one get himself as healthy as possible. Um, basically, when he gets back on that field allow his weapons uh, to win games for him, and when he has to, um, take his shots. Right. I was going to say, do you like the Eagles' weapons? Do you like what they did in the draft and what they have moving forward, They're depending on Deshaun Watson, Jeffrey, to come back as well? Uh, is that enough? Yeah, uh, to D Deshaun Jackson, yeah. Um, yeah, so Deshaun Jackson, like I said, I, I watched some of uh, his, uh, his, some of his uh, IG live feeds, and I saw him the other day. He was talking to Snoop, and uh, from what I gather, he said he's 100% healthy. Uh, I know he reached out to me uh, at the end of last year um, when he was battling that groin injury because that was something that I, that I was battling coming over from San Francisco, um, and it was a little bit of an issue when I got to, uh, to Philly, but uh, with the training staff that I had, and just with my 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 rehab uh, regimen, I was able to to maintain and, and keep it at bay, and so I was able to be productive. And so when you think of uh, the talent that Deshaun Jackson possessed, you know you see what he can do and how dynamic he is when he when he's on the field. And this is really a, a message to a lot of these uh, these kids um, that are out there watching. No matter what your ability ability is, if you're if you're if you're hurt and you're not available uh, to your team. Um, how can you how can you contribute? How valuable can you be? So taking care of your body is one of the the, the first and, and main uh, things you should really concentrate on, um, as well as really understanding the offense. Um, your ability will will be there, but you know taking care of your body is definitely key in the in the success and the longevity uh, of your career. So now I think when you think about the weapons that they have and they possess, um, when you look at the NFC NFC East. Um, they're right there. I mean, they're going to be they're going to be in the hunt every year. Uh, depends on what the Cowboys do. Um, depends on how uh, the Washington Redskins how how they come around, how they build. Um, yeah, so it's it's and you look at the Giants. Let's see uh, what they do over there. They have a young quarterback uh, themselves, and so uh, the NFC East it's, a, it's 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 up in the air. It's a, it's it's uh, for grabs. What do you miss most about playing in the East and playing with the Eagles? Uh, just the competition, number one, I think just the rivalry. Um, you think about, uh, you know, the, the clash of the, the beast of the East, you, you automatically you think of the Eagles and the Cowboys. Um, you know, Redskins haven't been able to do anything uh, as of late. Giants, they kind of, they've been teetering. They've been kind of up and down. Uh, but it's always that matchup. They're always even. They're always kind of neck and neck. And they're always like a, a half a game or a game. Uh, from each other as to, you know, who's going to win the division. 
Um, so, you know, I miss most is the competition. Uh, I felt like I rose to the occasion um, w whenever there was a, a, a really uh, a, a televised game. Obviously, there was a lot of Thursday night, Monday nights, Sunday night football. That's when I, I, I kind of I played, played my best and I understood um, really what was at stake. I understood my role as a, as sort of like a, a tone setter. Uh, anytime that I got my hands on the ball, I, obviously I wanted I wanted to make something happen. Um, and again, I just wanted to be a main staple, uh, a go-to guy, a playmaker, really a game changer uh, for whatever uniform that I played on. So when you think about the game itself, um, it, it's not really, I think, a team that I really identify with because for me, um, I really had to adjust my game uh, according to the system. And I had to adjust my game to, to some of the quarterbacks that I played with. Um, just you know, early on in my career, I had to adjust my game in a sense from going from Steve Young, who was a drop back quarterback. Um, he wasn't much of a, when he got outside the pocket, he made some things happen, but traditionally that's not what he did. And so when Jeff came over, um, Jeff Garcia, traditionally, he wasn't a drop back, you know, uh, passer, throw the ball all over the field, 50, 60 yards down the field. That wasn't his game. So, we had to adjust. The offense had to, and the head coach had to adjust and, and play to his strengths. So I had then to adjust, uh, adjust to his game. And so when I went to the Eagles, you know, I felt like, you know, I, 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 I felt like, honestly, I had the reins cut loose. I was able to become the receiver that I think a lot of people saw glimpses of when I was in San Francisco. But overall, I missed the competition. It didn't matter. You know, I could have played in, in, in a wet paper bag. You know, <laughs> I would have been able to, 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 to thrive. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talk about your time in Philadelphia and the quarterbacks and you adjusting to different quarterbacks. McNabb and the relationship um, you recorded earlier this year um, after a Bleacher Report uh, the story that came out that said McNabb um, kind of blamed you for breaking up the team after the Super Bowl run against the Patriots. And you said, uh, tweeted at Masters saying, you know, if you're ready for the real story, um, you know, I'm ready to give it. Um, are you willing to give us that story today? Uh, not what today. I'm, like I said, I, I'm, I'm working on some things. But, uh, again, in response mm -hmm. to that, man, you know, for him, you know, being um, the quarterback, um, you know, of that organization um, and him, you know, having the power that he did, and I think there, there, there could have been some stances that he took, you know, that, that could have been in support of, of who I was and what I brought to that team. Um, I honestly felt that uh, he didn't appreciate uh, really, number one, what I was bringing to the team and how I complimented him in a sense of we made each other better. I think uh, it was a hard pill and it's hard for him to, to admit that I essentially, I made him a better quarterback. Not saying that that was my mindset or I thought that when we played because I don't think like that. When I came over from San Francisco, I felt like we complimented each other, but there were questions directed toward him, you know, in response to what I just said was, you know, they asked him like, do they do, does he think that I made him a better quarterback? He took offense to that. I mean, I don't have, I don't have a problem. And, you know, someone asking me, think, asking me if, if Garcia made me a better receiver or if, 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 if Tim or Tay made me a better receiver, we made each other better. I, I couldn't, I honestly, I couldn't do what I did without the quarterback. So I think it was a hard pill for him to swallow. And again, if you look at it, look at the stats before and after I got there. That'll tell you what you need to know. Look at his touchdown ratio versus interception ratio. Look at the amount of yards that he amassed before and after I got there. Trust me, the proof is in the pudding. I don't need to sit up there and try to bash him for any reasons. But I think there were coaches in the organization. They heard and they saw what he said. And so I have full confidence um, and, and, and very comfortable in sitting here saying that I don't have anything against Donovan McNabb. Maybe he had something against me because of the way the city of Philadelphia embraced me when I got there, knowing that he felt a certain way when he got drafted some years back that he was, it was between him and Ricky Williams. The city booed him. They wanted Ricky Williams. But he got the chance to prove himself and show that, okay, regardless, okay, you didn't take me, you know, uh, they would rather have had Ricky Williams, but they got they, they got done with Nap. Go show and prove as to why you felt like, you know, you you were the better pick. Um, but for whatever reason, like I said, you know, I never felt, felt the support of him. Um, he's one way on the camera, and he's another way off the camera, and I'm never going to shy away from that. 
Um, so at the end of the day, like I said, you know, I'm working on a documentary. Um, there's a mini docu series to to kind of document, you know, sort of like my career uh, with the mm. Players Tribune. Um, so okay. you know, there will be there will be a documentary documenting pretty much my entire career. Um, Is that coming out this year? Um, I don't know if it's this year or next year. Um, mm -hmm. But again, um, obviously the situation, um, the years that I spent in Philly, uh, that will be obviously a, a part of it. And this very conversation um, that will enter into some of the content. Um, but at the mm -hmm. end of the day, bro, um, I was very confident in who I was. I didn't come to Philadelphia to, to take away any limelight uh, away from Donovan. I think that's what he felt that I was doing. Uh, bro, I, I just wanted, I only wanted to add to what they already had over there. And so again, to, to make a statement that I ruined their championship run but if you think about us going into the to the you know going into the playoffs on the year that they that we went to the Super Bowl, he was in the media making comments saying that they he didn't need me, he didn't need me. So how so so now all of a sudden some years later, fifteen years later, you say that I ruined your run, I ruined your run. You didn't need me back then to make a championship run. So this should be all that you wanted. You didn't have me. This was a chance to prove that, in essence, that you didn't need To to make it to the Super Bowl when essentially you kind of did. Do you think you ever repair your relationship with McNabb? No, I'm done, bro. I don't, I don't get down like that, bro. My family, uh, the way that I was raised, bro, and I've said it, when you, when you deal with people like that, we call that two-faced. You're one way in front of the, in front of the camera and you're, a, you're another way off the camera. Don't, 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 don't switch sides. Don't, don't turn it on and off, you know, just to, 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 in a sense, I guess at a time of convenience to make yourself look good. Bro, he had a number of opportunities. Like man to man, he could have come and talked to me about any situation. Uh, there was a situation that, that came up during the course of the season. I approached him man to man because I didn't like the way that I was received and based, way, based on how he was treating me, it was based on the perception of, of who I was prior to me coming to the, uh, coming to the team. And so um, I didn't like it. Um, I addressed it and I moved on from it. So again, you know, he's supposed to be a smart guy, uh, intelligent guy. Um, so again, at the end of the day, bro, like I said, me and my family, me personally, I don't get down like that. So I, I, again, there's been opportunities where I felt like we've talked, we've been in the same, the, 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 same, uh, the same vicinity, proximity of each other. I mean, he was a few, as, as recent as a couple of years ago, I mean, we were playing on the same field and Larry Fitzgerald softball, uh, softball charity game. Um, again, for me, like I said, to be in that environment, I thought, you know, everything was, you know, copacetic, everything was kosher. And then now you come out with something like this, blaming, blaming me that I, that I ruined the championship run, bro, that's, that's two faced. Right. I, I, like I said, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't get down like that. Right. When you look back at your career and you look at some of the controversy, you look at, um, some of the coaches that you dealt with quarterbacks as well. Um, you now in a hall of fame, um, I, how do you sum it all up? You know, what, what gives you peace at night about what you put out during your career? Um, I think when you think about uh, comparing, you know, the top receivers, I think that's, that's, that's a discussion now. Um, just like we're watching the, the, the last dance and the comparison is, you know, is, is, you know, kind of, you know, trying to crown, you know, who's the greatest, uh, greatest of all time. Like I said, for me to be put in conversations, uh, as one of the greatest, and, and Jerry Rice will always be number one because of, you know, what he was able to accomplish. I have no championships. Uh, when you think about, you know, uh, the next up, um, who's number two or three, there's always going to be this conversation, you know, whether it's me or Randy. Um, for me personally, I'm going to speak highly for myself because I feel like I was a complete receiver. Um, mm -hmm. No matter what team that I played for, I played 181%. I think when you look back and you do your research, um, I never quit on my team. Uh, I never said any of the things um, that 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 would even um, give uh, my fans the idea um, that I didn't play hard. Um, mm -hmm. All you got to do is just roll the tape. That's all I can say. Roll the tape. I did it in the run game. I did it. I I did beyond just catching the football. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think when you look back on my career, early in my career, and you think about um, um, Bill Walsh, who coached uh, the Niners. Um, and then later on and early on in my career, uh, he was, I think he, he became a consultant or a GM um, with the 49ers. And he paid me the highest compliment ever saying that, you know, I was probably one of the most, uh, most high IQ guys he's ever coached. And you think about the guys that are played 
under uh, Bill Walsh and Joe mm -hmm. Montana, Steve Young, mm -hmm. Cherry Rice. And for him to say that about me, whether he was blowing smoke or not, um, that spoke volumes as to what he thought of me uh, as a football uh, as a football player. So when you mm -hmm. think about complete receiver, bro, just all you gotta do is roll the tape, roll, roll the tape, roll the tape um, backside yeah. up, backside of plays. Um, I knew right, I knew my responsibility. I knew as I emerged as a go-to playmaker uh, of a receiver, I garnered a lot of attention. I warranted that attention. So it enabled other guys to be open in any set, any formation. It allowed holes. Um, to, to be more open because safeties had to, you know, sway my way. Um, like I said, I dictated a lot of things offensively and defensively uh, for, for, opposing, uh, for opposing teams. And so when you think about the run game, like I said, um, I, I, was a, I, was a, I was a blocker first, receiver second. And I, and I was taught that in high school. Um, I made a joke about it at my Hall of Fame. Uh, at, at my Hall of Fame reception uh, ceremony in, uh, in in Chattanooga, where mm -hmm. I basically gave a lot of and paid a lot of homage to uh, my receiver coach, uh, Coach, coach uh, uh, Powell. And so, early on in my career and in, in high school, my coach basically he had everybody in the huddle, and he asked us like, "What's the most important thing of being a receiver?" Naturally you being a receiver, being young, you're going to say, catch the football. <laughs> right. So we all basically said, catch the football. And he basically said, no. He said, be a blocker. He said, be a blocker first, receiver second. And so I made a joke in my ceremony, you know, blaming him for me not being, being ahead of Jerry Rice now because had he taught me to be a receiver first and a receiver second, there's yeah. no telling what my stats would have been like. Would have been number one, huh? <laughs> right. Yeah, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today uh, on Monday. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, if you don't mind, you, do you mind if we open up the comments? Uh, I'm sure some fans. Oh are yeah, back man, Look, bro, you got me. You got me okay. for another seven minutes or so, man. Like I said, I I, I appreciate it. Uh, this opportunity just to kind of you know come on. Obviously, like I said, uh, I know that I'm a fan favorite uh, there in Philly. Uh, I love all the fans that are there in Philly, bro. I haven't had, I haven't heard not one negative comment that I've come in contact with from a fan um, that saw and witnessed me play uh, there in my 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 short stint there, and man. Uh, I, I can't be more pleased and, and, and show much, so much gratitude to all those fans that watched me play. And they just don't know. I appreciated them just as much as they, they appreciated me. Your favorite, a uh, couple questions from the readers. Um, one question, this one comes from, um, let's see. We'll go to Jay Delvin, Philly, your favorite Eagles jersey of all time. Well, favorite Eagles jersey? Oh, man. Mm, man, they were all fire. You know what I mean? Any jersey that I put on, I tried to make it look good. So no, it didn't matter if it was white, green, black, or whatever the case may be. <laughs> but I, I tend to – I kind of like the white jerseys because I didn't like to get I, I didn't like to get dirty. So if I can play in a white jersey and I not and I don't have any stains on it, that means I got down. That means I got busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this next question – this one comes from Erkant80. Um, it says, I saw you hanging out with A.B. Um, what's your thoughts on him and his situation after last year? Um, I think uh, A.B. has now, I think, has taken some time to kind of assess and uh, reevaluate, re um, you know, where he is right now um, in his career, what's at stake. Um, I think this guy has, I mean, we don't have to talk about what he brings on the football field. I think now he has to get him, his life. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in order, uh, correct some of those things. And then, mm -hmm. again, you know, it's all about, you know, what team is going to give him an opportunity. Um, I think that, the, like I said, the, the, the football, the playing, the performance, that's going to take care of itself. They want to know, um, they want to know really kind of where he is upstairs, where he is mentally. Right, right, right. Um, talking about next season, um, this question revolves around the NFL. What do you think next year will look like after the coronavirus? pandemic um i don't know I, I think it'll be i mean once we i think we, once we 100 percent resume back to a state uh of, of normalcy uh, I, I don't think you're going to see much of a difference i think prior to the early stages the emphasis stages of of trying to implement fans you know into to arenas or what have you i think you you we now are going to have a lot of more health conscious 
um, you know, fans. I think fans are now, even from them leaving their homes, uh, traveling out, um, you know, and, and getting back to a sense of normal. Fans are going to be, you know, washing their hands, uh, covering their face nature, because I don't think they want to go back to uh, a, a, an epidemic or a pandemic like this. So I think I, early on, I think you're not going to see, I think you're slowly see the attendance get back to where it is or where it was. Uh, but I think initially, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be cautious or it could be the opposite. You know, it could be, you know, guys feel like they're, they've been in jail and you let a guy free. You know what I mean? They're, everybody's going to go and, and be a support and just to try to create an, an, an atmosphere that we're back. We're going to, we're not going to allow, you know, something like this to really prevent us from progressing forward and hold us in, 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 indoors and inside. And so I think, uh, you know, it'll be a slow process, but we'll get back. Just have a few more minutes. One, thank you yeah. once again for joining us. I'm um, just going to take a, just probably one more question. <laughs> um, this question, do you think you could still play in the NFL today? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about an opportunity and really managing expectations based on obviously, like I said, I'm, I'm an older, I'm an older uh, guy. So obviously you, you would think, okay, how valuable, uh, where, where I would be uh, valuable to a team. And me personally, when you look at third down situation, when you look at red zone, um, that's somebody that, again, like I said, me having the knowledge uh, of the game as I, as I do, um, understanding, you know, how to run routes, you know, how to get open, um, and again, it could bode well for, for any team, especially if, they, if, we, if, if I have uh, a, a number one, uh, you know, receiver over that's already garnering a lot of attention, they're not just going to leave me one-on-one. -on -one. Like right. I said, I'm not a Hall of Famer for no reason, so I know how to catch the ball. I don't have to run for like 20, 40 yards if that depended on if I'm in a third down situation on midfield or if you get into the red zone. I mean, that's, that's, that's easy money right there. Okay. I'm interested in this one. This question comes from Yo Kells. We have about two minutes left yeah. uh, before we have to sign off. What celebrations did you have planned that you never got to do? Um, none. I think, I, I mean, wh whatever time period that I was in, uh, mm -hmm. if there was a dance or whatever that was popular then, I tried to incorporate it uh, okay. into my celebrations. Um, but like now, like I said, there's no telling what I would. Uh, trust me, you think, you, you think Odell Beckham Jr. broke the internet. Just, just imagine <laughs> if I was, if I was, if I was in this era. Uh, if Twitter and, was as big, and, yeah. You're right, and be able to to do some of the things creatively uh, that I can come up with. Oh man, oh man. Well, T.O., thank you once again for joining us here on on this Monday afternoon on Inquirer Live at lunch. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Take care. Um, definitely encourage everyone to buy your mother's face mask, custom face mask. If you Absolutely. Want to plug her IG one more time. Um, yeah, it's uh it's uh M O B Y Maryland. M A R I L Y N. So so definitely go check it out. Uh, I want to thank all of our followers for tuning in today to listen to TO and the latest. We talked a lot, NFL draft, last dance, and much more. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. TO, thank you again. Absolutely. And you guys also, Alex, I know you guys are following me on my uh, all my on my social media, uh, my Instagram, my Twitter. Follow, follow your boy on TikTok, too. I'm, I'm getting down. Oh, down. the TikTok. Okay. <laughs> That's right, man. I've been TikToking late, lately, uh, having a lot of fun with uh, some of these creative dances, skits, and things of that nature. Uh, it's just me really just really giving back and making people laugh, uh, right. have something to do, entertain. That's what I do. You can't All expect right. anything less. So follow <laughs> me on TikTok. And you tell everybody, follow me on TikTok. It's the same as my Instagram and Twitter handle, at Tara Lawrence. All so right, T.O. T.O. on TikTok. Thank you again, T.O. No doubt. All right. <laughs>